concentrations of people on Earth and the world's most dangerous earthquake zone. The 30 million residents of the greater Tokyo area feel 50 earthquakes a year. Japan as a whole is battered by one-tenth of all the world's earthquakes. July 12, 1993, a magnitude 7.8 off the coast of northern Japan. The tiny island of Okushiri gets the brunt of the flow. Toppled gas stoves create a firestorm. Then, 15 minutes after the earthquake, a tidal wave lashes in. A 20-foot wall of water rips across the island, taking homes and people with it. In Japan, they are known as tsunami and are dreaded even more than earthquakes. Seaweed in the telephone lines marks the height of Okushiri's deadly tsunami. Elsewhere, more devastation and the outbreak of new fires. When it was finally over, Okushiri measured its loss. Over 500 homes destroyed, more than 100 dead. It was Japan's worst earthquake in 45 years. The islands of Japan were created by volcanoes and earthquakes, a process that still continues. Japanese legend told of a giant catfish beneath the sea thrashing its tail to cause earthquakes. Today it is known that earthquakes in Japan result from the fracturing rock of one giant crustal plate diving beneath another. Tokyo sits atop four separate plates. For centuries, the Mihara volcano has erupted five to ten years before most major Tokyo earthquakes. Mihara's last warning was in 1986. In Tokyo, the frightening question is not if a great quake will strike, but when. Here, like Los Angeles, the big one is overdue. At a new multi-million dollar disaster preparedness center, earthquake survival skills are taught daily to Tokyo citizens. It's a popular attraction for school kids who usually enjoy their ride on one of the world's most advanced earthquake simulators. The students practice turning off gas lines, propping open doors, and finding a safe place to ride out the tremor. It's a kind of virtual earthquake reality. A tour of the center also includes a big screen dramatization of what the next great Tokyo earthquake will be like.
This is the shrine to the victims of Tokyo's last great earthquake. It is built on the site where in 1923, 40,000 people huddled together to escape the raging firestorm sweeping through the city. It is also the place where those 40,000 people died, incinerated by flames which engulfed them. The giant earthquake struck without warning. The fires began during the shaking, which lasted a full five minutes. Within hours, most of Tokyo became a hellish inferno. Nearly a million people were suddenly homeless. 142,000 were killed. It was the deadliest earthquake in Japanese history, and it leveled most of Tokyo. Today, the citizens of Tokyo can experience the quake of 1923. A shaker table in Tokyo's Earthquake Science Hall replicates the event precisely. For the last 11 centuries, Tokyo has suffered a powerful earthquake about every 70 years. It has been 71 years since the last one. Groping through a hallway of artificial smoke helps to sharpen survival skills for the catastrophic earthquake which could occur at any time. The Japanese Meteorological Agency houses the nerve center that monitors the seismic activity of Tokyo and Japan. The scientists are required by law to provide warning for the giant quake. In theory, unusual seismic activity will be detected before the quake strikes. If that happens, the wise men will be summoned. Six of Japan's most eminent seismologists will be rushed by police car to a special meeting room at the earthquake center. Once they've reviewed the data, they must decide if Tokyo should be warned. A rehearsal of the procedure occurs once a year under the glare of news lights, but so far the wise men have never actually convened, and most experts believe their mission is impossible. This whole prediction process is a farce. No earthquake has ever been predicted with that degree of accuracy. They're expecting to predict it within two days. I would say that's almost impossible. Peter Hadfield is a journalist and geologist who lives in Tokyo. Two years of meticulous research, which included interviews with virtually all of Japan's leading seismologists and disaster preparedness experts, has left Hadfield extremely concerned. On the surface, Tokyo is prepared. This is what they will tell you, and this is what all the brochures say, and this is supposed to be a very safe city. In fact, uh, the, the disaster prevention in this city is a mess. Its enormous size and choking density are just the beginning of what makes Tokyo so frightening in the face of a giant earthquake. The ground on which this sprawling city stands is largely soft and unstable soil, which will intensify the shaking caused by seismic waves. Ground turning to liquid from the shock of a sudden quake can have a devastating effect and 25% of Tokyo's land may liquefy. The greatest threat of all is firestorms raging through a city where propane gas tanks stand next to apartment buildings. Tokyo's wooden houses and narrow congested streets will make firefighting a nightmare. Disaster planners have created computer models of how the firestorms will spread. In this horrifying scenario, at least one-third of Tokyo will quickly burn to the ground. More than half a million buildings will be totally consumed, and 40,000 people will die. The Shirahiga area is one of Tokyo's most dangerous, and to stop the expected firestorm, a firebreak has been built in the form of a huge apartment complex. Steel shutters will block the flames while water cannon and sprinklers attempt to suppress the heat. It is the Great Wall of Tokyo on 24-hour alert, waiting for the inevitable earthquake disaster. Behind the firebreak building, an evacuation park, 
The space is intended for safety from the fire on the other side, but in fact, it is much too small for the huge crowds who will try to use it. On September 1st of every year, the anniversary of Tokyo's last great earthquake, Japan conducts Disaster Day. It's a chance for Tokyo's citizens to participate in one of the world's most elaborate and well-organized disaster prevention exercises. Disaster Day is a nice idea. It reminds people of the fact that an earthquake is going to happen. But uh, the problem is they come to Disaster Day on September the 1st, and by September the 2nd, they've forgotten all about it. So uh, what purpose does it serve if it's really just going to act as a kind of fun and games for people? It gives a sense of unreality about the whole thing. I've spoken to people at Disaster Day who are coming and taking part in the exercises and putting out fires, and I say, do you believe that a big earthquake is going to happen? And they say, no, they don't believe it. When the earthquake does happen, it will have consequences far beyond the city limits of Tokyo. There is obviously going to be a major earthquake here and a major loss of life, but it's the economic damage that a lot of the world has not considered. Tokyo now is one of the major financial cities in the world and the impact of this earthquake is going to be devastating for other countries around the world. Japan will have to pay for the damage and the damage could run up to about a trillion dollars. That money will probably come from Japan's foreign investments. Over the last 10 years, we have become addicted to Japanese cash. The Japanese have been investing in U.S. bonds, in the European stock markets. They've got a lot of cash and a lot of assets tied up overseas. And the only way to pay for this earthquake is to bring that money back. They will sell the bonds, they will sell the shares. This will cause major crashes on the European and U.S. stock markets and bond markets. And in fact, we're looking at possibly a major worldwide recession. Meanwhile, Tokyo waits and braces itself for the great earthquake that is to come. Whether it strikes within weeks or years is really beside the point. That it will strike is certain. Each year, thousands of people die in house fires. Tragically, many are children. That's why State Farm developed the program called Smoke Detectives. It helps teachers teach fire safety to their students. Kindergartners through sixth graders learn how to recognize fire hazards, develop escape routes, and handle fire emergencies. In just two years, nearly 70,000 kids have been donated to schools. And State Farm wants your school to have one, because a child's safety is everyone's concern. September 17, 1989, a magnitude 7 earthquake struck 60 miles south of San Francisco. lasted only 15 seconds, but the damage was severe. The tremor was named after the mountain under which it occurred, Loma Prieta. It was an earthquake that had been expected in the 30-year span of time between 1988 and 2018. Houses and buildings were damaged. 63 people lay dead or dying. Shut off the gas, shut off electricity, store water, prepare for aftershocks, prepare for three days in those 
services. You got 90 minutes of light left. You better make use of your time. You go in there, you have 15 minutes. The earthquake was 15 seconds, and you have 15 minutes to take your whole entire life. Amid the agony, destruction, and loss, there were also moments of joy. the chief seismologist at the U.S. Geological Survey in Menlo Park, California. He and his colleagues had forecast the earthquake and had grown extremely concerned by two significant foreshocks only months before. When the magnitude fives came, we just issued four, our warnings for a three to five day period, and we did not issue an intermediate term warning. And there are regrets about that, I think, on the part of many of us, that after the second magnitude five, something more should have been said. At that point, we didn't know what was coming, but we sure had a sinking feeling in the pit of our stomach. Two floors below Alan Lynn's office, earthquakes are routinely predicted. It's not hard to do if you create them on a microscopic scale. Blocks of granite are pressed together in much the same way that the plates of the Earth's crust grind against each other on faults. Then, the scientists watch for signs of a quake. There it goes. Yep, right now. There, yeah, there we go. Now, that was a nice amount of premonitory slip. That big strength signal. Uh, that looks like but do earthquakes work this way in reality? The fundamental scientific question about earthquake prediction, does the Earth give a little before it breaks? Does it groan? Does it give us some kind of cracking or some sound, some, some signal that something catastrophic is about to happen? And it's easy to illustrate that. If you just take a stick or a yardstick and bend it, as you bend it, you're doing exactly what the plates do as they move. They bend the, the, the crust of the earth. It's a brittle substance, stronger than steel. And as it bends, it stores energy, just like this stick is. The question is, as this stick approaches failure, is it going to do anything to tell us that it's about to go? And in that case, it didn't do very much. It just broke. Chinese attempts at earthquake prediction date back nearly 2,000 years to when this earthquake detector was invented. In 1966, after an earthquake killed 8,000 people and left the city in ruins, Premier Cho Enlai paid a visit to the site. Deeply moved by the suffering and damage, he declared a people's war on earthquakes. He threw the country's resources into a prediction campaign. Seismic stations were established throughout China, and an army of scientists and trained observers searched for signs that might predict a quake. carefully studied for evidence of unusual activity prior to a tremor, a folklore of strange pre-quake behavior dated back for centuries. In 1975, the work paid off. Reports of foreshocks and other events began pouring in from Haichang. An earthquake prediction was issued, and nearly three million people were evacuated from their homes. Soon after, the earthquake struck. Magnitude 7.3 tremor destroyed almost 90% of Haichung's buildings, but countless lives had been saved. It was a milestone in earthquake prediction. And then, one year later, in the city of Tongsheng, a giant quake hit without warning. A city of more than a million people was virtually buried alive. Shocked and perhaps embarrassed by the failure to predict the quake, the Chinese government eventually announced that 250,000 had died. The real Tongsheng death toll may be three times as high. A nightmare had become reality. It was the deadliest earthquake on the planet in more than 400 years. America's only official prediction of an earthquake was made here along the San Andreas Fault. 
1985, a team of scientists with the U.S. Geological Survey wired the town of Parkfield with an array of instruments designed to capture a quake as it happened. Earthquakes have occurred here on a regular basis. A magnitude 6 strikes on average every 22 years. As cameras watched the fault, scientists patiently waited for the quake they predicted would occur sometime between 1985 and 1993. Magnitude 6 earthquakes had struck here like clockwork for 130 years, but this time, the Earth refused to move. The mysteries of earthquakes extend far beyond prediction. Very little is known about how they actually rupture. At the University of Nevada, Dr. James Bruin uses foam rubber models to explore how earthquakes really behave. Scientists have long wondered why the movement of the giant San Andreas Fault doesn't create tremendous frictional heat. Brune believes the reason lies in the way faults move. Earthquakes may travel along the fault in ripples. Carpet layers have found out long ago if you want to move a, a large carpet around a ball, across a ballroom, you don't try to slide it because there's too much friction. You'll tear the carpet apart. What you do is create a little buckle in it, push the buckle across the dance floor, and that's a very easy way to move the carpet a few inches. If faults can move so easily, it makes it all the more difficult to know when an earthquake will strike. The accurate short-term prediction of earthquakes, seismology's holy grail, is something that scientists may never be able to do. Even if you could, you've got to think about what would you do with that information. You see there's an earthquake tomorrow at 3 o'clock. Well, what do you do? Do you jump on the freeway? and get killed in the traffic jam getting out of town. I mean, we kill more people every holiday weekend in California than we killed in the Loma Prieta earthquake. Uh, there is also the uh, financial disruption that would be involved in people really panicking. And especially if you have some level of false alarms, if you're not perfect at it, and you're gonna have some times that this prediction was made and not turned true, you could cost a lot of money and cost more money and kill more people than the earthquake would have without the prediction. And so it's really debatable whether it's useful. I think the fact is, we're scientists. We love information. If we ever could, we'll still do it anyway. <laughs> On April 18th, 1906, a massive earthquake took San Francisco by surprise. A Hollywood movie depicted the catastrophe. This is the real aftermath. A 270-mile section of the San Andreas Fault had jolted itself northward by 20 feet. Today, the San Francisco Bay Area is threatened once again by its violent seismic history. We have a pretty good record going back about 160 years. From 1830 up to 1906, we had a period of very high rate of activity. And then came the great 1906 earthquake. That was followed by 70 years of near total quiet. Just a few small events started to occur in the 1950s, but really nothing much until 1979. This has been described as a seismic cycle. We clearly now, with Loma Prieta and the magnitude sixes that preceded it, are in a period of renewed activity, the active half of the seismic cycle. The places now most threatened lie on an eastern spur of the San Andreas. It is called the Hayward Fault, and it runs under one of the most densely populated parts of the entire San Francisco Bay Area. A magnitude 7 plus on the northern Hayward Fault is, is going to take a terrible toll, and how big that impact will be in terms of human life and economic loss depends on the preparations we take. We know it will happen, it's just a question of when, and if the time is used wisely in the coming years or decades, we can clearly cut the losses by quite a bit. In times of trouble, you can count on good neighbors like State Farm and the American Red Cross. Our jobs are different, but our goals are the same, to help people. That's why State Farm, its agents and employees, are giving to Red Cross Disaster Relief, so that victims of future disasters will always have someone to lean on. You can help, too. 
Call the Red Cross at 1-800-842-2200. This is a beautiful example of a reverse fault, and this type of fault is perhaps a fault that was responsible for localizing an earthquake or perhaps a rupture that took place during an earthquake. Dr. McGarrion is an urban geologist, and this is his laboratory. He has identified numerous fault lines throughout New York City. Earthquakes can occur here. Earthquakes have occurred here in the past. Not large magnitude earthquakes, but... There were not many people here. There were not many structures here. New York City looked nothing like this in 1884 when a magnitude 5 earthquake shook it severely. Its fault lines, however, still exist, cutting diagonally across Manhattan through Central Park, 42nd Street, and under Greenwich Village. Dr. Klaus Jacob is a seismologist at Columbia University. A damaging earthquake in your city is inevitable. The question is only when, not whether. Is New York City prepared? No, clearly not. Many of New York's buildings are made of unreinforced brick and mortar, which will not withstand even moderate shaking. Steel frame skyscrapers may not collapse, but their shattered plate glass windows could fall onto people below. Tunnels could snap, and bridges may be damaged. The scenario is bleak. No water, no power, chaos in the streets. A disaster for which this city is unprepared. There's no consciousness towards earthquakes in New York City. There's no plan. In the scale of human time, it's easy to forget that New York City is a moderately active seismic area with a magnitude 5 earthquake about every 100 years. You ask people in New York about an earthquake, they will say, are you crazy? I never heard of an earthquake in New York City. I probably have more chance of getting hit by a taxi cab on my rollerblades than of dying in an earthquake. <laughs> As long as I'm not in California, I know that's where they all at, so... I'm not worried about earthquakes. Should I be? The main problem here is the lack of awareness. People think an earthquake cannot occur here. It's not true.